Good evening. Nice to see you all uh, this evening. Um, in my uh, early days of being a Christian at university, uh, there was one bit of Matthew's Gospel that I was really, really struck by. The whole Sermon on the Mount, I was reading and reading and couldn't get enough of it. But there was one bit in particular that I kept thinking about. It was a bit that says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father in heaven, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. And I kept thinking about it. It was extraordinary that Jesus says, not everybody who says, sort of, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. In fact, to some of those people, Jesus will say, I never knew you. Depart from me. In fact, I remember um, at one stage at university, handwriting it and putting it on my wall, sort of thinking about it. I don't know what it was about that verse that particularly struck me. I'd come from a very nominal Christian background where there were lots of people who sort of claimed the name of Jesus on the outside but sort of weren't living it. That's how I had been for a long time. Perhaps people who would say, Lord, Lord, and yet the thought that there would be some people that Jesus would then say, I never knew you. It's extraordinary. But there are people who claim to be Christians who aren't actually Christians. There is a category of people, Jesus says, who will say, Lord, Lord, and yet aren't actually truly Christians. They don't truly know Jesus. Um, now, that's not us being judgmental. We're not the judge. Jesus is the judge. Only Jesus knows that. But there is a category of people who say, Lord, Lord, and yet ultimately who are not uh, Christians, who are not saved. Now, that's a sobering and slightly stark beginning to the sermon. But it is important for us to think about that, because that, in some sense, is the, the background, the context in our minds as we think about this extraordinary story in Acts uh, 4 and 5. So have that in your mind as we look at this passage. We're going to see three things. Uh, the first is Jesus blesses his people. Jesus blesses his people. Now, remember the context. In chapter 4, there was a fairly significant opposition to the message of the gospel. We saw apostles in prison. Now, this is the beginning in Acts of a time of opposition, of persecution, of division, and even problems in the church itself, as we've seen in this passage that Paul read, as we'll see in future weeks. And yet, nevertheless, Jesus was blessing his people. Verse 33 Great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them. It might be tempting amongst all the sort of exciting details and the extraordinary things of this passage to skip over that verse, and yet it's really important because Jesus was giving grace to his people. He was blessing his people. Where is Jesus at this point? Well, he is risen from the dead. He is ascended he is at the right hand of the Father, the beginning of Acts uh, tells us. He is reigning on high, and he is blessing his people from heaven. He is showering them with good things, with blessings. In fact, in chapter 4, they prayed for boldness, and they were filled with the Spirit. This is the answer to the prayer. God is answering their prayers, building his church, giving them grace, even amongst opposition, even amongst difficulties, he is giving them grace, blessing them. That's true for us, isn't it? Has that been your experience in life? It is true for us today. The Lord Jesus is blessing his people. He is blessing his people, showering us with good things, grace, both in this country, around the world, in Ukraine, in the midst of conflict. We've prayed for that. Jesus is doing that. What does that look like? What did that result in uh, for the early church? Well, verse 32, now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Verse 34, <clears throat> there was no one among them who lacked anything. For all who possessed lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. They distributed to each as one had need. Jesus blesses his people. What's the result? The people share that blessing. 
They share it with others. They give good things to other people. There's a community of love, of unity, of togetherness. They share what they have. Now, this is not, um, dare I say this, some sort of communist redistribution. This is not something imposed upon them. This is something they've freely chosen to do. They want to do this out of their own volition, their own free will. They cared for one another financially. Not just financially, but they shared all their stuff. It would have been their food, perhaps their clothing, perhaps their, their tools, whatever it looked like. The new people of God, the church of Jesus Christ, newly formed here, were joined to him and therefore joined to each other. They were a community that shared their stuff. So much so that all their needs are met. Verse 34. Now for us, of course, uh, we perhaps live in a slightly different time, and yet nevertheless we have things like a care fund. We have a care committee that oversees uh, the redistribution of stuff like this. That's because we are joined together. We are joined to the Lord, and therefore we are joined to each other as his people. We share what we have. It may look practically like perhaps the sharing of food or the sharing of clothes or, or, or a car or uh, perhaps toys or books or money, whatever it looks like. It's what we do as a church. That's why we were thinking this morning of sharing our possessions, our things, for people in Ukraine. Because they are part of our family. This is a worldwide family of Jesus Christ. We are joined to them in Ukraine. If we've never met them, perhaps, yet they are our brothers and sisters, and therefore we share the good things that we have. They were a community joined together, blessed by Jesus, and it, as a result, they blessed one another. They shared what they have. Now, um, one of the good things about social media, uh, there are many, um, but one of the good things is some of the sort of the local community groups. I know that some of you are a part of this group because when I took that screenshot, just under that were lots of your pictures that I thought I probably ought not to put on the internet. Um, but this is, a, this is the old time community group. There are other groups, of course. One of the great things about being part of this group is you do genuinely get to know what's sort of going on in the community. People get very excited about the police helicopter overhead. I don't know why that gets people excited. Parking issues, dogs muck on the streets, that type of stuff. But one of the things people share, if people have got something free or got something extra, they will share it, offer it to other people. People are beginning to sort of share their stuff. People interact with one another. It does genuinely bring some small sense of community. People share. But that type of sharing has its limits, doesn't it? You wouldn't share everything. And yet, here, in Acts 4, they share radically. They share their stuff. They are one together. They have all things in common. How is that possible? It's only possible when the Holy Spirit has changed your hearts. It's only possible if you truly have experienced the blessing of knowing Jesus. If you've encountered that, if you've had your heart changed, well, that changes everything. You have to have a life transformed by Jesus. To put it starkly, what we've just seen at the end of chapter 4, that only happens if you are genuinely a believer. If you've had truly your heart changed by the gospel. So how does that sacrificial life come? Well, again, there's a hint in verse 33. With great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. There we go. You see, it's almost a throwaway line for Luke. But the apostles were proclaiming Christ risen from the dead. It was the gospel it was Jesus uh, risen and ascended. That was central. That was what the community was based on. That's what has the power to change lives. That's what forms community. The gospel of Jesus. And if we have that, if we are blessed by Jesus and come to know him, well, that changes us, doesn't it? 
That changes our hearts. So that's the first thing. Jesus uh, blesses his people. Hopefully, my voice will carry on for the next two. The second is, Jesus dwells with his people. He dwells with his people. Now, where is Jesus in this passage? Well, he's in heaven, isn't he? He's ascended. He is at the right hand of the Father. And yet, he is active in the church, dwelling with his people in their midst. Uh, 5 verse 12 says, Through the hands of the apostles and many signs and wonders were done among the people. And verse uh, 15, They brought out the sick on the streets, laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing might fall on some. Verse 16, A great multitude gather and are healed. Now these miracles, as the miracles are in the book of Acts, are a testimony to something. What? Well, the power of the gospel. The power of Jesus. It's Jesus at work. Verse 12, 5 verse 12, notice two things. It wasn't the ordinary Christians doing the miracles. Verse 12 says it was the hands of the apostles. It was the apostles doing it. It was the mark of an apostle to do these things. That's what I think verse 13 is about. Verse 13 is a tricky verse. I think verse 13 is saying the people held the apostles in such high regard that they were in a sort of slightly separate category. They didn't want to sort of join them. They dared join them, but they held them highly in esteem. They were the ones doing the miracles. But verse 12, it wasn't really them doing the miracles, was it? Through the hands of the apostles. You see that? The miracles are done through the apostles by somebody else. Who's doing it? Jesus. Jesus is the one doing these signs and wonders through human agents, through the apostles. But it's Christ doing it, dwelling with his people, ministering to them. That's why we have this strange reference in verse 15 to the shadow of Peter passing uh, on them. This, I think, just reflects the power that Jesus has, the power to heal. Jesus doesn't need to be with him. He's in heaven, and yet he can still heal. The apostles don't even need to touch someone. Just Peter's shadow is what they're hoping for. It's not there's some sort of magic in Peter's shadow, I don't think. It just shows the power of Jesus. If you've been with us for our series in the morning, looking at the signs in John's gospel, you may remember the second sign, the end of John 4, where Jesus heals an official's son remotely if I can put it like that. He's nowhere near. Yet he says it and it's done. It doesn't have to be there. It's the Son of God. Jesus is in heaven and yet even through the shadow of Peter, he is healing. He is with his people doing amazing miracles. But he's also with his people doing something very shocking. And that's where we get to this bit in chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira. Verse 1. A certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. They sold something that they had, and he kept back part of the proceeds and brought a certain part of it and laid at the apostles' feet. Now, this is in contrast to at the end of chapter 4. The end of chapter 4, we see people selling all that they have and giving everything to the apostles. And yet here, they are claiming to do so, but holding it back. Look at verse 8. Peter said, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, yes, it was for so much. I did sell it for that amount. But actually, that was a lie, wasn't it? Verse 2 says, they kept a certain amount back. What's happening here? is that they are lying. They are claiming to be doing the right thing, claiming to live a certain way, and yet not doing it. Verse 4, uh, Peter actually says, it was your choice. The land was yours. You didn't have to give it to the church. <laughs> you didn't have to give all of it to the church. You didn't have to give any of it to the church. It was yours. The issue was they were claiming to do it, but weren't actually doing it. That was the problem. They were lying. On the outside, they looked good, didn't they? They looked actually 
very, very good. They looked very generous, giving it to the church. And yet, on the inside, things were very different. They were claiming one thing, but actually living a very different life. Now, Becca and I have been watching this TV series on Amazon Prime called Reacher. If some of you have been watching that. It's based on the books by Lee Child. And in the first series, this uh, retired uh, military detective, military police officer, is investigating a fraud. And the fraud is to do with fake money. Fake money that's being printed and shipped off. Of course, the problem with fake money is, how do you tell that it's fake? It's really hard to tell. In the end, if you want to determine whether it's real or, or not, you need experts. You need people who know what they're doing, who can, uh, who can analyze it, perhaps machines that can weigh the paper and so on. There's always some sort of giveaway, but it's almost impossible for regular people to know. Is it real or is it fake? Well, in the end, real or fake Christians, how do you know? We well, don't. But God knows. God knows the heart. There is a distinction, but it's invisible. It's at a heart level. It's on the inside. On the outside, Ananias and Sapphira looked pretty good, didn't they? And yet in the end, Peter, as an apostle of the Lord Jesus, says, verse 3, that Satan had filled their heart to lie to the Spirit. I think when we say that Satan has filled their heart, that must mean that they are not Christians. They are not his people. They have lied to the Holy Spirit. As Paul said, they've lied to God. That's a good little verse to know. Is the Holy Spirit God? Yes. As we can see, they lied to the Spirit, they lied to God. But how did they lie to the Holy Spirit in this situation? Well, it's because they lied to the church. Jesus was with his people, the church, through the Spirit. The Spirit was dwelling in their midst, and so the lie to the church was a lie to the Spirit. What a thought that is. The church, our church, is not a club. It's not an organization. It is a fellowship, a family where the Spirit lives, where the Spirit is personally present amongst us, in us. And that means that a church where people squabble, where people perhaps put themselves first, where people look after their own preferences, their own interests, well, that's a church that ultimately won't survive for very long. I don't know about Ananias and Sapphira. Maybe they were selfish. Maybe they'd forgotten the spirit was amongst them. Maybe they didn't think about others in the church that needed the help. I don't know. But what I do know is they claimed to be doing the right thing. They weren't doing the right thing. Ultimately, it was a lie to the Spirit. They grieved him, and Jesus will not allow his church to be compromised. Verse 5, he fell down, breathed his last. Verse 9 and 10, the same happens for his wife. Now, they knew the truth. They didn't live it. They lived a lie, and Jesus judged. He was with his people in judgment. It's a sobering passage, isn't it? It's a difficult passage. He was with his people judging. Now, I know this doesn't happen very often in the church, although a church I once knew of, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to, a church I once knew of uh, told me, this was years before I was born, a long, long time ago, and had a members meeting, and uh, their pastor was this lovely, sort of well-known uh, preacher, pastor, very lovely man. And all of a sudden, at the members meeting, one church member stood up and really laid into him, really was aggressive, very confrontational. Everyone was really shocked. And later that night, this church member died in their sleep. And the person telling me the story said, and at the next members meeting, everyone was really friendly to the pastor. <laughs> Well, make of that what you will. It doesn't happen very often. But there's a reason that it happens here. And I think it's at the start of the church. As the church is beginning, it's a warning. A warning to treat his church as holy. You know, there's a story in the Old Testament 
in, uh, in Joshua 7, when the people have just had a great victory at Jericho, and Achan takes back for himself, he fancies his coat and the silver and gold, and he hides it under his tent, if you know that story. And in the end, his sin finds him out, and he dies. It's a shocking story, just as the people have had victory. Just as the people are about to enter the land, there's this reminder. This is what happens with sin. I think that's what's going on here. They keep something back for themselves. As the church is growing, as there is victory at the beginning of the church, it's a reminder, a warning, not to be fake Christians with unchanged hearts. Now, I know when I say that, there are some here who have very tender consciences, perhaps who struggle with things like assurance or worry or anxiety. And perhaps they might be at this point thinking, what does that mean? Now, there are are people like that who I know genuinely love the Lord and genuinely have had lives changed and transformed by the Holy Spirit, who love his people, who are grateful for the gospel. Uh, This is not you. But perhaps there are people either here or watching who really haven't had lives changed by Jesus, who really perhaps go through the motions but are totally unchanged by the gospel, have no fruit whatsoever, who perhaps claim the name of Christianity, of Jesus, but yet somehow aren't sort of living it. And if that's the case, this is a warning, this is a reminder. It's never too late, though, to hear that reminder and to be changed. It's never too late. Never too late to repent. That's the good news of the gospel. So, Jesus is with his people, blessing them, dwelling with them in miracles, even this judgment miracle. And then thirdly, finally, Jesus grows his people. How does the church respond to this judgment miracle Well, in fear, verse 5. Verse 5 ends, great fear came upon all those who heard these things. Verse 11, great fear came upon all the church and upon those who heard these things. Not surprising, right? If this happened, they feared. They held God in deep honor, reverence. They treated his name as holy, as awesome. They'd seen this happen. This raised the stakes for them as a church, didn't it? That this was happening. The judgment uh, grew Christ's people in their faith. This bad thing, this sin, resulted in something good for the church. They grew in fear of God. They grew in reverence and, and adoration for him. Whatever happens, God uses for our good. That's extraordinary truth, isn't it? If you think of Romans 8, for example, a profound mystery. Often it doesn't feel like that at the time, obviously. But as you look back, aren't you aware? Even the hard things, even the suffering, perhaps even your sin, God has used for good. He uses it for good, even in the dark times. Just think about it. We read this story pretty coldly. I don't really care about Ananias and Sapphira. They're just names on the page, aren't they? Yeah, they weren't just names. They were real people. Imagine being in church. Perhaps you sat next to them on a Sunday. Or you had them over your house. They were part of your care group or the first century equivalent. Perhaps in chapter 4, you'd prayed with them. You knew these people. They were your friends. They weren't just names on a page 2,000 years later. People would have been shocked, upset, hurt, mourning. And yet, even from that, God brought good. The people feared him. They knew that God was faithful. They learned to grow in their faith. Jesus was growing them. But not just growing his people Uh, Also, verse 14, growing people numerically. Verse 14, believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Multitudes, both men and women. God was at work. And God is still at work in the world, in us, 
through us. And that means in Swindon, there are men and women, boys and girls, who are not yet Christians, who God has chosen, who are his people. They will become his people. They will be saved by us proclaiming the gospel. If we learn anything from the early church, is that they were bold to share their faith and the Lord added to their number. That's our task. That's our task. To be a community that loves one another, shares things, is united together, and proclaims that gospel. And the Lord adds to our number. We wish that were more and more the case, don't we? We wish there were many, many more people coming to saving faith. And yet we know that there are. We know that there have been people, even over the last few years, who've come to faith. We can think of them. Some of them are in the room now. I'm not going to make eye contact with them now. But we know that that's the case, that God is adding to his number. But that's our task. How does God do it? Through the church, through his people. Jesus is alive. He's in heaven, but he is working through his people, through us. The great line in the hymn, from heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. That is what Christ has done. He has come to win a people. He has died, redeemed his bride. He's ascended, and he now, by the power of the Spirit, is joining more people to become part of this great family. And he does it through us.